As we move through these ancient times in the past, we've been making baby steps as the world's gone from a hellscape incapable of supporting life to something that shows some real potential, but it has been slow going. Over three billion years has already passed since the formation of the Earth, and so far, the only things currently living look like this. But by the end of the Archean, things were starting to at least slightly resemble our modern world. At least comparatively speaking. And with each step we move forward in time, we're just a little bit closer to the world we know today. This will be the last time that I cover an entire eon in a single episode in this series, because this video will take us all the way to just half a billion years ago, and that's when everything finally starts to get interesting. I feel like all this has just been the legwork to get us to the good stuff. And now, finally, we're at the last step of setting the stage. So now let's get into the Proterozoic Eon, and see what transformations the planet and the life on it go through over the next two billion years. And this one actually turned out to be a little bit more interesting than I expected, because I actually didn't know a lot of the things that I ended up researching for this video. We start things off with the Paleo-Proterozoic. This is the longest of the three eras that make up this eon, and in fact it's actually the longest era in geological history covering from two and a half to 1.6 billion years ago. But I think for several reasons, it would actually be easier if instead of covering each era like I did the last time, I just jump from one major event to the next. And the reasons why will become clear as we move forward. And the first big thing that took place during this time is a direct result of events that took place in the Archean. You see, as the cyanobacteria spread and multiplied, they took in carbon dioxide and excreted oxygen. At first, the increasing oxygen was kept in check by being absorbed by the increased iron that was in the oceans. And as that happened, Oxygen did what oxygen does to iron and started to rust it. And it's believed after several million years, the end result was the oceans turning from a turquoise color to a deep blood red. The rusted iron eventually drifted down to the seafloor and eventually made up the iron oxide that we see in these stunning formations. But there was a finite amount of iron in the oceans. And as that dissipated, the oxygen would start to build up to levels that the Earth had never seen before. This may sound like a good thing to us, but at that time, the oxygen was actually toxic to pretty much everything that was alive. And it makes sense if you think about it. The organisms that lived at that time lived on a world where carbon dioxide and methane were more abundant than oxygen. In fact, there was almost no oxygen at all until the cyanobacteria started farting it out all over the world. That's all the oxygen really was to these guys. A waste. And just like us when we exhale carbon dioxide, these gases that these organisms give off is normally toxic in large quantities. In the modern world, there's checks and balances to this because plants take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen and animals do the opposite. But during the early Proterozoic, there was nothing on Earth to take in oxygen and replace it with the new carbon dioxide. So the noxious, deadly cloud of oxygen kept building. And this would be the end of the line for the mighty cyanobacterian empire. That's right, Tim Tim. You and the rest of your kind are destined to slowly suffocate on your own farts. A fitting end, if you ask me. This would be the very first mass extinction that would ever happen on Earth. Also known as the Great Oxidation Event, or Great Oxidation Catastrophe. So the first great dying didn't start with a super volcano or a meteor, but by the very air we breathe today. And oxygen levels would continue to fluctuate throughout Earth's history. This was just the first really massive jump that would ever take place. And the Earth wasn't even done seemingly trying to cleanse itself of the goo infestation that it had contracted over the previous one and a half billion years. Because things were about to go from bad to worse. Remember how, during the Archean Eon, the increase in oxygen led to global cooling and inevitably resulted in the first glaciation? Well, as you may have guessed, this may be foreshadowing for some things to come. The world was cooling at a rapid rate as free oxygen built up in the atmosphere, and there was nothing to counteract it at this point. So, eventually, it resulted in a runaway glaciation that would go way beyond anything that Earth would see in the more recent past. For over 200 million years, the Earth 
literally froze. This time has been called the Huronian Glaciation, or First Snowball Earth. Yeah, first. So at this point, we've literally seen the Earth transform from Mustafar to Hoth. And this could have been how the story of life on Earth came to an end. But sorry, I'm not going out like that. Because thanks to all of you last week, it's time for an upgrade. Freedom! What? No! And come to think of it, this actually brings me to the other big event that happened during this era. The emergence of eukaryotes. Eukaryotes literally encompass every kingdom on Earth that is multicellular, as well as some unicellular organisms like protists. Now there's some debate on whether or not they truly did evolve during the Paleoproterozoic, but to me, the fact that some of the cyanobacteria did manage to survive means it's likely that something had to start absorbing oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide at some point. Following the Huronian glaciation, we come to a time that scientists have nicknamed the Boring Billion. And yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. After the first mass extinction brought on by oxygen pollution and dramatic climate change, what was left when the world finally melted was a nutrient-poor world that was kind of stagnant for an actual billion years. Starting at 1.8 billion years ago, this time actually started to see a drop in oxygen once again. And this allowed the cyanobacteria to take control again, and this put us eukaryotes in a bit of a tough spot. And this may be the first time that evolutionary pressure from another group of organisms started to affect the direction that evolution would go. You see, we eukaryotes seem to be a little bit more adaptive than the cyanobacteria. And it's believed that in the stale waters of the Boring Billion, our ancestors would branch off into three very different paths. The first would take a similar approach to the cyanobacteria and begin producing their own fuel from the sun brought on by photosynthesis, since sunlight was in plentiful supply and they didn't have to compete for it. Another would start breaking down the nutrients left inside the cells of dead organisms through decomposition. And finally, the last one would start getting its energy from consuming other organisms. These are the most basic differences between the three main kingdoms of multicellular eukaryotes. The producers using photosynthesis would eventually become the plants. The decomposers would become fungi. And the consumers would become animals. I should probably just mention real quick that there's way more than just three groups of eukaryotes. But for the premise of this story, those are the main three that we're going to be focusing on. So, in a way, the Boring Billion turned out to be very important. Because during this time when the continents didn't even seem to be moving around a lot, the eukaryotes started to diversify under the second cyanobacterian empire. Higher levels of methane given off by many of these microbes probably kept the water much warmer than during the Huronian glaciation. But as a result, the cyanobacteria continued to increase in population again. And inevitably, they would have the same impact on the Earth a second time. And now, after all this time, we've arrived at something truly monumental. Somewhere along the way, during the Boring Billion, the different forms of life that evolved from the basal eukaryotes had become multicellular. And around 760 million years ago, the very first animal with this new scale would appear in the fossil record. And it was... A sponge. It was called Otavia, and although these creatures didn't have a nervous, digestive, or circulatory system, and they still don't, they're still considered closer to an animal than a fungi or a plant. They get their energy from filtering particles out of the water through their pores and... Wait, wait a minute. Timtim? That's right, I still live. <laughs> Don't... 
do that. I don't know how you managed to survive the oxidation catastrophe and Heronian glaciation, but now we're about to get hit with a one-two punch of glaciations because your old friends won't stop multiplying and farting ice house gases into the atmosphere. Yeah, okay, maybe some volcanoes might have had something to do with it too. But I'm still blaming you. But I'm not even a cyanobacteria anymore. Shut up, Tim Tim! The Cryogenian was a period in the Neo-Proterozoic that lasted from 720 to 635 million years ago. It was called this because the world quite literally was in a constant state of being cryogenically frozen and thawed. During the stretch of 85 million years, the planet likely became a giant ball of ice on two separate occasions. And after all this, the world was in rough shape. The cyanobacteria were still around, but they were brought down from their status of rulers of the Earth for sure. As we enter the Ediacaran, we see that a new group was ready to claim dominance. And somehow, all three groups of eukaryotes managed to survive the glacial roller coaster and come out of it ready to expand into new forms. It is here that we first start to see a seafloor that's populated with animals and plants. Jellies first started becoming abundant at this time, as well as possibly even the earliest basal cephalopods. That's still a debated topic, though. It's also when we see my new form Spragina first appear in the fossil record in southwestern Australia. And you might notice that it bears a strong resemblance to a certain super widespread fossil that will appear in future episodes. One thing that we are sure of, though, is that even though life was technically at its most complex as of yet, it was still pretty simple. Soft-bodied and most of them not even having brains, it's still a pretty far cry from where we'll eventually end up. But after being through every imaginable hellscape to get here, it's pretty beautiful. And now we've finally come to a big turning point. We've traveled through the first three eons, the Hadean, the Archean, and the Proterozoic, and now we just have one left to go, as we come to the dawn of the Phanerozoic Eon. And here is where we'll need to slow down quite a bit, no longer flying through an entire eon in a single episode. Next time we'll start to get a lot more interesting. Which is good, since I don't actually know how much longer I could stretch out the story of the Precambrian. Anyway, since we're turning a corner in the History of the Earth series, I feel like it's time for me to make some steps to further evolve as a content creator as well. I have always avoided Twitter in the past like the plague on society that it is. And even though I still stand by everything I've ever said about that platform, its usefulness to creators is undeniable. So I've decided to start being more active there. I have, there's always been a paleoanalysis Twitter account, but I really just made it because I didn't want somebody else to make a paleoanalysis Twitter account. It could just be one more way for all of you to interact with me, and we can discuss subjects about natural history, and I can share my videos with people who haven't found my content yet. So if any of you want to follow me there, I'll leave a link in the description. Alright, Tim Tim, come on. I guess I'm stuck with you for now. I am the ultimate survivor! <laughs>